All right. Welcome to the California Desert Coalition's webinar, Tools for Effective Advocacy, Media Training 101. This webinar is being recorded. Hopefully you've attended one of our past uh, webinars. If not, you can watch the recordings on our website workshops page. If this is your first workshop with us, welcome. Next slide, please. One moment, sorry. Ironically, the next slide is about tips for using Zoom, <laughs> which clearly uh, we can all use those. Um, but in the meantime, while, while April works on the slides, please take a moment to find your mute button and uh, stay muted when you are not speaking. And don't forget to unmute when you are speaking so we can hear you. Um, please use the chat feature at any time. You can register a question or a comment through the chat and we will be monitoring the chat um, so we can take questions or, or refer to comments during the Q&A. And there is also a raised hand feature um, that you can use, there we go, during the Q&A. It's a small group tonight, so we may not meet, need it, but if you do want to ask a question or make a comment, um, it's helpful to use the raised hand feature so we can better manage um, the queue. And you'll find these features, they should all be at the bottom of your Zoom window in a menu bar. If you don't see them, the menu bar might have disappeared. You might just need to move your cursor around to make it reappear. Next slide, please. Oops. Now I can't see my screen. <laughs> um, thank you, April, you're great. Um, so a little bit about the California Desert Coalition. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit 501c3 committed to the protection and preservation of the Mojave Desert landscape. And by preserving the landscape, we preserve the cultures and customs, ecosystems, and economies and quality of life that bloom in the desert. Some of this work we do includes building grassroots coalitions, educating and mentoring community members to participate in decision-making processes. And we also develop and advocate for community-driven desert conscious policy and land management. You can follow us and please do follow us on social media. You can also go to our website, cadesertcoalition.org to learn more about the work that we do. Our Facebook page at CA Desert Coalition. And please contact us anytime via email, info at desertcoalition.org. Next slide. And now the most important part, our speaker for tonight, Caitlin Scott, Vice President of Full Court Press Communications. Um, for an expanded biography, please check out the workshop page on our website. Um, but just to give you a little taste, Caitlin has worked on issues ranging from economic justice, affordable housing, um, to community building and, and ecosystem restoration. She's placed stories for clients in the Washington Post and San Francisco Chronicle, Mercury News, Sacramento Bee, among others, some of our state and nation's uh, most well-known publications. Um, since, apologies, 
Caitlin is a media strategy and media relations expert who has worked in government and public affairs in Washington, D.C., and since 2015 has been with the Oakland-based firm Full Court Press Communications, which is one of the leading communications firms for social justice and, and conservation issues. Um, she has also, or she does also, lead planning media relations and outreach for large-scale national conferences, including the successful launch of Hewlett Foundation's Open Rivers Fund. And she has an illustrious client list that includes Tipping Point Community, All Home, Conservation Lands Foundation, East Bay Community Energy, First Five Alameda, Resources Legacy Fund, the Pew Charitable Trust, and Amazon. And we are very, very fortunate to have Caitlin with us this evening. So with that, I will turn to her and she's going to lead us through the magical world of understanding media and how to uh, put a good story out into the press. Great. Thank you, Marianne. And thanks so much for having me. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction as well. Um, can you all see my screen here? Intro to media, op-eds, LTEs, and earned media? Look, yes. Yep. Cool. Great. Okay. So um, just quickly, Mariana did a great introduction um, of myself and also a full court press, but just um, kind of a brief rundown. Um, we are a strategic communications firm based in Oakland, California. Um, we work primarily with organizations that we loosely define as social change organizations. So we work primarily with organizations working to make the world a better place, helping them tell their stories. And a big, big chunk of our work at Full Court Press is with conservation, um, public lands, and environmental organizations. So very much relevant to the work um, you guys are doing at CDC. And I think some of you may have even worked with um, my colleagues, Sarah Hirschwalker and Suzanne Spencer. So um, great to meet you all if I haven't met you and nice to see you again if I, if I have met you. Um, great, so tonight we're gonna talk about three different types of press coverage. We're gonna talk about op-eds, letters to the editor, and earned media. So each of uh, significant value, but they each serve a different purpose, and there's a little bit of a different approach to uh, securing each of them. So I'm gonna offer you some um, tips, some process recommendations, um, both for developing content and then hopefully getting it placed in a newspaper or an online publication where it will reach the people that matter to you and to your cause. So starting with an op-ed, um, has anyone on the call um, placed an op-ed before or written an op-ed? Maybe if you just want to take yourself off mute and give me a verbal yes or yes or no or or a, what are you talking about? I see a thumbs up from Mariana. So I, she's placed some op-eds, Richard, Susan. Okay, great. So some of you at least have a little, some of you have some familiarity with op-eds and what they are. Basically they are an opinion piece written into a newspaper or an online publication. Oh, you can't unmute yourselves. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, I won't ask you to do that again then. Um, so opinion pieces are different for from press coverage. Um, typical press coverage is a reporter goes to an event or hears about a story and they write about it in a paper or an online publication or an audio story on the radio. An opinion piece um, is typically by a guest author to the newspaper and they are submitted by community voices. So um, they're a really effective method of reaching other community members and also really effective at reaching elected officials. Elected officials care deeply about um, the opinion pages because it's a way, it's one of many ways for them to have their finger on the pulse of the community. So questions to ask yourself at the beginning of your op-ed process. You've decided you're gonna write an op-ed or you've decided you're gonna work with an organization to write an op-ed. At the very outset, you want to decide, what am I trying to accomplish with this piece? What does success look like? Having the answer to this question will inform every other part of your op-ed 
and ensure that you're not just getting coverage for coverage sake. You want to make sure that your coverage moves the needle on your goal, gets you closer to what you're trying to accomplish. So ask yourself, how does this piece move my effort towards its larger goal? When I see this piece in print, what outcomes would make its publication a success? So start with your goal and define success. Oops. Then you want to think about who you're trying to reach. Identify your target audiences. We always say to our clients and in strategic communications, the general public is not an audience. It is just too broad of a group to reach effectively. You want to think really critically about who are the people I need to reach in order to build support for my cause or my issue. Is it business owners? Is it tourists? Is it recreationists? Is it elected officials? And then from there, try to get even more specific. Is it my uh, representatives in the state legislature? Is it small business owners in a certain zip code in a certain industry? Really try to make it as specific as possible. Okay, key messages and call to action. Opinion pieces should be firmly rooted in campaign or organizational messaging. Keeping that content fresh and relevant to your audience requires you to ask the following questions. What do my audiences need to hear from me to move them to action? Keep in mind that key messages and the op-eds that you create based on your key messages, they are never about what you want to say. They should always be about what does my audience need to hear from me in order to gain their support or in order to gain their trust or in order to get them to take the action I want them to take. So rather than thinking, what do I want to say? Ask yourself, what do my audiences need to hear from me? What is my unique angle or perspective on this subject? How is it different from what other people are saying? We always encourage our clients to identify something we call their only we, meaning what is it that only we can offer to this discussion? What can I share with my audiences that they won't hear anywhere else? Um, another thing to think about in terms of messaging in your op-ed is how can you make this relevant to the current news cycle or make it timely? Editors look out for timely news hooks. They want a reason to put this in their paper right now. So making it relevant to the current news cycle, making it timely, will make it more likely that it's going to catch an editor's eye and it's going to get published. And then op-eds should always include a call to action. What, do, what action do you want your audiences to take? Do you want them to call an elected official? Do you want them to donate money? Do you want them to um, volunteer? Um, you really want to make sure that a clear ask is brought to your audiences. And there are a lot of um, opinion, opinion section editors who will not run op-eds that don't have a call to action. Okay, identifying a strong voice. The most important part of an op-ed is the author who gives it a voice. So when thinking about if you should write this piece or maybe someone else in your network, again, just as, just as the op-ed is never about what you wanna say, it's about what your audiences need to hear, who your audiences hear it from matters as well. Trusted messengers really matter. So you want to think about who those trusted messengers are that your audiences will listen to. So maybe that is you in some cases. Maybe in some cases it does make sense for you to author that op-ed. But in other cases, it might make sense to identify another author um, if that's who's going to resonate with the community. So ask yourself, who has a perspective my audiences will listen to and care about? Do we have a strong voice or ally from a community who doesn't often weigh in? Is there an opportunity to elevate someone else's voice? Is there specific messaging I want to convey that would be authentic to a specific person? 
and who has a firsthand compelling story to tell. So some questions to ask yourself when you're identifying an author. The next bit is about storytelling. Storytelling is a really important component of op-ed writing and a really com important component of media relations in general. Storytelling is what brings your messaging and your issue to life. It's what people remember. Um, there's that phrase, people will forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. The same concept applies here. People will forget facts and figures. They may not absorb all the minutia or legislation language or things along those lines, but people remember stories. They remember stories because they're humanizing. They help personalize an issue and they can really do so much more powerfully and much more quickly than reciting statistics, historical facts, etc. They paint a picture Again, they bring the messages to life and they also give you credibility. So here are some storytelling examples from op-eds. So these were from, from a couple years ago, op-eds um, in desert publications in 2019 and 2018. So you can see in each of these pieces um, how the authors pulled in their personal experiences as veterans and um, as business owners. So lastly, once you have an op-ed, you know what your goals are, you've identified an author, you have a fantastic call to action in your piece, you have great messaging, it's written by someone who's gonna resonate with your audiences, you need to figure out where to place it, right? What newspaper are you gonna put it in? Or what online publication are you gonna put it in? It's really, really, again, important to go to where your audiences are. An op-ed in the New York Times does not help you if your audiences don't read the New York Times. So you really wanna make sure that you are meeting them where they are, going to where they get their information and putting your op-ed there. So you can think about the geography that your audience resides in, where the author lives and works, specific landscapes or places mentioned in the piece, um, the issue's relevance to a, giving, a given community. And again, go to where your audiences are. Meet them where they are. Okay, so moving on, before I move on from op-eds, are there any questions in the chat? It doesn't look like it. Does anyone have any questions about op-eds? I know you can't unmute yourself, but feel free to type it in the chat. I will, I'll unmute. Um... Um, yeah, people should be able to unmute now. Yes. Uh, me, uh, yeah, Richard, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question. Are you recommending ghostwriting um, op-eds for people who may not be that great at writing, but who are in the community known to be uh, people with influence? Definitely. Ghostwriting um, op-eds definitely is a really common practice. Um, that I definitely recommend. Whenever you ghostwrite a piece though, the author must approve it um, and sign off on it. So um, ghostwriting is definitely a commonly accepted practice with op-eds. Just make sure that the author has reviewed it and signed off it on it and has agreed to put his or her name on it. Thanks. Great. Okay, so we're going to talk um, next about another type of press coverage, which is letters to the editor. Um, I'm sure you all have seen these. They're often in the um, inside cover or the local section of a newspaper, and they are letters from community members responding to either something specific that was in the paper recently or um, an issue that is of importance to the community. So same thing as with op-eds, you can ghostwrite these for folks or something we do a lot is provide templates for folks to customize themselves. Um, and letters to the editor are much shorter than op-eds. Um, they are usually 200, uh, 200 to 350 words. You can find word requirements for opinion pieces and LTEs on most newspaper websites. Both for op-eds and LTEs, do not go over the word limit that is indicated by the um, outlet's editor. 
Um, typically, if you do that, um, the editor is going to bounce it back to you and say, uh, you need to cut, um, cut 100 words or whatever it is out of this and then resubmit it to me. So make sure you're being mindful of the uh, word limits. Identify one key message in an LTE. You only have 200 to 350 words, so you really want to focus on one thing compared to an op-ed where you have maybe 600 words and you can hit on three or four key messages. You really just want to focus on one in the limited space you have in an LTE. Um, make it timely. Again, give the editor a reason to put it in their paper right now. Make it connected to an article or another op-ed. And then both for op-eds and LTEs, typically submission information is on the website and they'll give you an email or there'll be an online form that you can submit your piece through. And then um, we also frequently uh, will call the newsroom to um, check on the status of a submitted op-ed. Um, and typically you can get a little information that way as well. So here's a sample template letter to the editor. You can see how brief it is. It's very to the point. Um, and then it ends with a strong call to action. Congress must address climate change's ongoing threats to our public lands and rivers. It's time to pass and then a placeholder for the bill name. So really concise and to the point, one key message, strong call to action. Don't go over the word limit. Letters to the editor are a little, a little more straightforward than op-eds because you're working with so much less real estate. Okay, earned media is any type of media that you don't pay for, meaning it's secured through media outreach via a press release or a pitch or um, a press conference or some kind of interaction with a reporter. Um, earned media is the flip side of the coin. You'll hear the term paid media, which means um, advertising or um, advertorials are becoming a more common um, thing in print media where it's a story, but then it'll have a disclaimer at the bottom that it was paid content. So that's paid media. Earned media is anything you don't pay for. So let's say you've written a fabulous press release. You had a fabulous press conference and a reporter says that they want to do an interview with you. Typically with earned media, you're going to have some form of an interview before the piece is uh, published. So what I'm going to walk through right now is five essential do's and don'ts for effective media interviews. So these are just some quick and dirty tools to have in your toolbox that will help guide you through um, a conversation with a reporter, whether that is an interview or, um, you know, as we um, all get vaccinated and go back out into the world again and press conferences start happening, these tips can also serve you um, at a press event as well if you get into a conversation with a reporter. So first, anticipate questions in advance and prepare. Think through the questions a reporter is likely to ask you about your release or your story or your issue and practice out loud your responses. Um, I really can't stress the importance of, I cannot stress enough the importance of preparing for media interviews and preparing not just for the tough questions, but also the basic questions as well. I remember so vividly being with a client at a press conference and she was ready to go. She was prepped, she had her key messages, she was ready for the curveball questions and the reporter's first question to her was, so tell me what's going on today. And she got completely flustered because she wasn't prepared for such a basic question. So think through the easy questions in addition to the tough questions, prepare in advance. Always deliver your message regardless of the question. Going into media interviews, you should have key messages that you want to deliver in the interview stick to those key messages. Use the questions as vehicles to deliver the information that you have. Always keep in mind your target audience when delivering your message. Keep in mind that press is not an audience. Reporters, press, media, they are a vehicle to your audience. 
that reporter is not the person you're trying to convince. You're trying to convince the person who's going to read the reporter's article or watch their story. So keep in mind your target audience, use language that will resonate with them. Tell a story, again, just as in op-eds, stories are a way to bring your messages to life. So incorporate a story. And then lastly, be prepared to answer the question you really hope isn't asked. If there's some difficult question that you go into an interview thinking, man, I just really hope this reporter doesn't ask me about this one piece of legislation or this one landscape or this one issue, you really don't want to walk into an interview like that. Be prepared for the questions you hope aren't asked. Okay, and five essential don'ts for effective interviews. One, nothing is off the record. If you don't want it in the story, just don't say it. Just make it clean and simple. If you don't want it in the story, don't say it. Don't ramble, be short and to the point. This is particularly relevant if you are doing audio, uh, audio interviews for radio or on-camera interviews for television. Those stories are very short. So you wanna keep your answers short and crisp and also make them easy to edit. Don't use industry jargon. Use the language of the reader or the viewer. Don't lose your temper or argue with a reporter. I know this can be tough, particularly when we're all um, working within spaces that we feel really passionately about, but it's just really not a good idea to argue with a reporter. So if you feel yourself getting a little hot while talking to a reporter, just take a deep breath, take a second, collect yourself, and then keep going. Um, don't be afraid of silence. Take a moment before you speak to gather your thoughts and then stop speaking when you finish your sentence. Remember that um, sentences end with periods, not with ellipses. So uh, when your thought is complete, stop your sentence um, and be done with your thought. Also, when doing interviews with reporters, don't feel like you have to fill the silence. Just say what you need to say and then be comfortable with the silence. It's, it's okay. So those were five essential do's and don'ts for earned media. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. And I'm happy to take any questions um, anyone has about op-eds or LTEs or media relations or um, communications in general. Thank you, Caitlin. That was wonderful. Um, we'll open it up to questions. Anything from our audience? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> we have a new message. Ah, you still can't unmute. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. that Let me take a safe. look. Try it now. Okay, I'll there start out then. Yeah. Great. That, that worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, my name's Susan, and I've been uh, st starting to write some press releases for the Salt and Sea Coalition. And um, I've never done this before. And my idea was that, or my understanding of it was that because some of the issues reflect on our region, but some at the state level, and even some at the national level, because of the funding that's going to be required, that I need mm -hmm. to broaden the target audience. And mm -hmm. it, because what we really want is to raise the profile of the issues so that more reporters will write about it. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at the media as my target audience, at least for this, and mm -hmm. trying to say things that will get them interested in covering the situation. So in that case, do you advocate casting a wide net in terms of media? I mean, little bitty local publications as well as the Sacramento Bee mm -hmm. and the San Francisco Chronicle and LA Times mm -hmm. and all that? Or do you still think that we should keep it short? And to, I mean, 
keep it narrow, keep our target audience narrow? Mm -hmm. So it's a really good question. I think what I would ask, and I apologize to answer a question with a question, um, but why is it that you want reporters to write about it? What's sort of the, the why behind that? I think because we, two things, we want to um, embarrass the politicians into doing mm -hmm. something because nothing mm -hmm. has been done for so very long. And we also want to get the public educated about this so people start demanding it of their elected officials. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, I it sounds like your audiences are elected officials and um, general public that you want to sort of make some noise about this issue. So I think I would say, are those elected officials state? Um, are they in the state legislature? If so, maybe you should broad it. So it sounds like, yes, state yes. legislature. Yes. So um, Sacramento Bee, Cal Matters, um, Capital Public Radio, all of those would be great places to go to get those um, elected officials' attention. And then in terms of um, the general public, that's where I would focus on those local papers. So I think maybe for what you're trying to accomplish, state and local would be where I would go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Oh, and then one last question too, um, before mm -hmm. I let somebody else in. Um, uh, when you're specifying a response to a story that has been in the media, is it a good mm -hmm. idea to include a link to that story or is it not a good idea? Yes, I think it is a good idea because when I email reporters, I always ask myself, how can I make their job easy? How can I make it easy for them to say yes to me? So if I lay out a case of saying like, this story was in, you know, this publication, and this is why I think it's important, and here's why I think you should write about it. Giving the link just sort of helps draw draw the connection. Again, makes their job easy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Richard. Okay, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, let's say you're targeting three or four publications, and you've got a great op-ed. Should you change it because the chances of it getting picked up are slim anyway. So, or should you make sure that you've got different op-eds with a similar message going to three different sources or do you just use the same one? So um, typically um, papers won't run op-eds on the same subject um, too close together. I, my sort of rough rule of thumb is if an op-ed, or excuse me, if a newspaper ran an op-ed on a topic, they're not gonna run an, another one on that topic for another two to three months. So if you got a great op-ed in one paper, I would move on to another one. Does that answer your question, Richard? I wasn't no, sure if I understood. I was really interested in whether you could shotgun a great um, op-ed to three or four different places at once and whether that would be embarrassing. I see. I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. Um, so I typically, I don't think I would send the same op-ed to multiple places. For one, a lot of papers make you uh, ask you to sign an exclusivity agreement, meaning that you commit to not sending it anywhere else. Um, what you can do though, is use the same messages and the same information and reformulate it into another piece, or you can reformulate it into an LTE or you can reformulate it into social media content. There's a lot of ways to sort of recycle the same information um, and you know, kind of upcycle it or turn it into different things. So that might be what I would suggest instead of um, submitting the same op-ed to multiple places. Thank you. Um, it looks like I got a question sent to me We've seen people interviewed where it's clear they're not, so this is from Susie, where we've seen people interviewed where it's clear they're trying not to answer a question. Is there a sophisticated way to squirm out of a question? Um, yes, um, there's a technique called bridging um, where you sort of use the question as a way to pivot into a different um, line of conversation. So you can say something like, that's a really interesting question, um, but I would ask you to think about it in this way, 
or um, you also can pull a thread out to say, um, what I'm hearing in your question is that you're very interested in, uh, you know, in public lands. And I agree, I am also very interested in protecting public lands. So you sort of pull a thread out that um, builds common ground, and then you sort of uh, turn to go in another direction. It's definitely a skill that takes time. I think all of us have seen people on television, particularly on cable news, do really bad bridging in a way that's defensive and really kind of cringy and hard to watch. Um, so I think it's definitely a skill, but um, I have some bridging phrases that I can share with Mariana after this call that um, maybe I could ask her to pass along to you all. Yeah, we'll add those resources to the um, to the web page for this webinar, um, along with this video, and we can also add some um, some videos. I, I know that there are clips out there for training purposes of uh, people who have bridged or pivoted very well, and those who have not done so well. Um, so we can put those in there too. But honestly, a great thing to do is when you're listening to the news and listening to an interview, um, really listen for those things and listen for them amongst different audiences, whether it's a community member or an elected official, listen to how they're answering questions and you can pick up a lot too. Definitely. I definitely agree with that. Um, and another question, we have a bill headed to the assembly floor. Can you speak about timing, timing of press release, op-eds, letter to the editor, how close to the vote? So I think um, it's hard to say without knowing the details. I think a lot of the answers to those questions depend on the state of play and sort of where you're trying, you know, is it the day before the vote and things are looking really good? Or is it two weeks before the vote and you're still trying, you know, you're still doing a whip count trying to make sure that you have those votes. So. I think the strategy depends a little bit on how much support you have. I would suggest um, thinking about the press release op-eds letter to the editor as part of a holistic strategy. So are you guys doing a lobbying day a few weeks before the vote where maybe there's several meetings going on with legislators and if you could have an op-ed or a press release be timed to that to kind of set a legislator up to be like, to see the op-ed and then say, oh yeah, I saw, I just talked to those people the other day. So you sort of hit them in two different angles. Um, so I would think about it as part of a holistic strategy. Um, and definitely if the bill passes and is successful, use that as an opportunity to take a victory lap, put out another press release telling them how successful it was. Um, we always say in strategic communications, you either tell people you've been successful or you tell them you've been fabulously successful. So those are your two options. So if you have a moment to tell them you've been fabulously successful, definitely take it. Caitlin, I have a follow-up to that question. Um, with regard to press releases, which you did not go into, into in this presentation, um, I know that there are there are some organizations or some individuals who feel like press releases are the be all end all. Like they they need to do a press release for everything. And can you briefly tell us what is a press release really for, and what's the best use of a press release as opposed to an op ed, an LTE, or these other mechanisms of getting your message and your story out there? Mm -hmm. So I think press releases are really, really useful for reaching a wide net of reporters with a newsworthy story, reaching them in a short amount of time. Being able to blast out a press release to 300 reporters is a very efficient way of reaching them. Um, the question you have to ask yourself before you put out a press release is, do reporters care about this? Is this a story that they're going to want to write? How do you know if it's a story that they that they're going to want to write? Well, is there a third party validator? Is there a personal story about someone in the community to tell? What's the community impact? What's the long term impact? These are all kinds of questions that um, that can help inform if a reporter is going to want to write about this. Um, there's some mixed there's mixed uh, thought, schools of thought on the value of putting press releases on the wire, things like MarketWire, PR Newswire, 
things like that. And those are wire services that will post your press release to um, a ton of downstream uh, news platforms. I think that the wire is really useful for SE, excuse me, for SEO, for search engine optimization. If you want, when someone Googles your organization for this piece of news to come up immediately, the wire, using a wire service is a great, a great tool for that. But I think in terms of just raw media relations, the wire isn't, isn't, I mean, it's really expensive too. So you just have to think about kind of bang for your buck. Um, so yeah, so those are some some considerations when putting out a press release. Thank you. Additional questions from the audience? I have a couple, but I want I want to see if anyone else from our attendee list or uh, members of the public have any first. Susan, you look like you want to ask another question. <laughs> I got, I have tons of questions. <laughs> Go for it. Um, how, uh, in your experience, is it good to be confrontational? Will that get more of a response? You know, do you call someone out strongly because they're being hypocritical? Or mm -hmm. is, will that come back to bite you? So I think it, it depends entirely on what success looks like to you. In any given campaign, success is going to mean different things. So if success is getting on the local news by any means necessary, then maybe confrontation is the way to go. We worked on a campaign a handful of years ago where the client or our, um, the coalition we were working with was doing all kinds of guerrilla tactics, standing up at press conferences to interrupt Ryan Zinke and doing all kinds of stuff like that, which was like really fun and like really funny, honestly. Um, and it definitely got coverage. Was it in-depth coverage of our issues? No. Yeah. Was it interrupting Ryan Zinke's press conference so he okay. couldn't, so it interrupted his message? Yes. So it depends entirely on what exactly you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's times where it can be really useful um, and like also probably just like satisfying to like do, but um, it, it totally depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll ask one and see if any of our other members have questions. Um, so one situation we've run into a little bit with some of the desert campaigns that we've worked on with your colleagues, for example, is um, related to an op-ed usually, um, not so much with an LTE, but you know, we have just a little bit more language and messaging that's relevant to kind of paint the picture. And it may be just over that word limit um, mm -hmm. Do you ever submit, say, two versions, especially if it's a paper you've worked with before that's like, here's the bottom line word limit version, but here's the one that paints the whole picture a little bit better? And is that, you know, something you can do depending on the media outlet if you've worked with them or not? Or do you frown on that? Like, how, how would you handle that when you just can't quite get it in that 600 words, for example, and, and have it make sense and have a call to action, et cetera? Yeah, so it's a really good question. And I think anyone who's written an LTE or an op-ed knows that those word counts can really be like the bane of your existence for the entire week you're trying to write that piece. Um, I mean, I so April, I've never done that, like submitted two versions to an editor. I can't imagine that would do any harm. Like, I don't think that an editor would say like, no, I'm not considering both. of Like, I just don't see that that would do any harm. Um, I think it would be unlikely that they would go with the longer one. Like I think that they would just take the shorter one. Um, so I think that's probably what I would recommend doing is just because I, I think it's unlikely they would take anything over the word limit, um, particularly for papers that are still in print. I mean, they actually can't. They don't have the space like they do online. Um, so I think I would recommend just submitting the shorter one. The other thing you can do sometimes is just call the editor and say like, I'm really struggling with this. Is there any way you would consider 
you know, an LTE that's 25 minutes over the word limit. And again, I just don't see that doing any harm. They'll either say yes or no. Um, the other just best practice I would offer for editing um, pieces down to their word limit is if if you can possibly get someone else to look at it, just a fresh set of eyes. My colleagues and I at FCP do that all the time um, because a fresh set of eyes can often see places to trim words, you know, taking things out of passive voice or removing a pronoun or something like that. A fresh set of eyes can sometimes spot those things and get it down to the word limit. So that's a kind of a trick we use sometimes. Yeah, Susan, go ahead. Um, how critical is it in a press release to have everything be, be under one page? Oh, I don't think it's, I don't think you need to keep it on one page at all. Okay. Um, particularly, um, particularly since like, you know, we used to fax press releases and stuff to people and we really don't do that anymore. It's just really online. So um, I think if you start to get into two and a half, three pages of a press release, I think that's probably a sign that you need to do some prioritization and some editing. But um, going over one page, I think is totally fine. Okay. And the second question, um, <laughs> I, is it important or is it a good practice to use a boilerplate describing the organization at the bottom of the press release? Yes. Yeah we always include a, a boilerplate at the bottom because it just makes it easy for reporters to see very quickly sort of what the organization is and, and kind of what they're looking at. So yeah, definitely. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Christina, I see you have a hand raised. Asked you to unmute. You should be able to unmute on your end. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for this. So my question is in regards to, you mentioned earlier that we should focus on our demographic, but being that, say there are some uh, local news uh, articles here that may be biased on the opposite side, would you, mm -hmm. wouldn't you think that it might be a good idea to reach out to the broader scope so we can get more uh, folks involved that may not live in the immediate community because maybe there might be a lot of issues regarding certain issues and, um, and if, you know, to draw attention from a broader group, would you say that we should still consider that to be a productive way of getting this message out there? Mm -hmm. So a couple of, I think it's a really, really good question. A couple of things are coming to mind. The first is um, in communications, we talk about communicating with sinners, saints, and salvageables. Um, the sinners are people that are never going to agree with you, no matter what you say. They mm -hmm. don't agree with you. They're not going to change their mind. That's why we put them in the center category. The saints, that's when you're preaching to the choir, right? These are people that already agree with you. Um, and the salvageables are the people in the middle who either don't have an opinion or are potentially convincible. Convincible? That's a word. Um, <laughs> you want to focus on, on communicating with your saints and salvageables. Commun trying to reach people that don't agree with you and are never going to is just not a productive use of time. It is exactly. a much better use of time and resources to uh, build, you know, turning the people that already support you into evangelists and ambassadors for your work and convincing the people that are movable to move into your camp. So I think if you're trying to place a piece in a paper that is read by people who are maybe not aligned with your position, I think it's important to ask why, why? Why do we want these people to read this? Um, do we think that there's a real chance that they could be convinced by this? If not, it might not be the best use of time and resources. Mm -hmm. So I think, Christina, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's what came to mind immediately for me. No, that you, you, that was, you, you nailed it. That was perfect. Thank okay, you. great, great, <laughs> cool. So we are at the top of the hour. Um, let's take maybe a couple more questions if there are some, because we did start a little bit late and then we will close out. And of course, if, if you all ever want to follow up, we would be happy to field additional questions um, to, to Caitlin. Um, 
or if Caitlin wants to do that herself, we can talk about that later. Um, but we can definitely, definitely get additional questions answered anytime. Um, do we have any last burning questions? I'm not seeing any hands, but feel free to jump in if, if yes. you can. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, if I want to address um, uh, a state official because there's a lack of health studies, is it proper to use the personal story or the human? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Whenever you're talking to elected officials, the more you can work in why this matters to you, what your personal story is, what your stake in it is, I think that that is incredibly valuable to elected officials. So absolutely. Yeah. Whenever possible, work in those personal stories. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I do one more. Do April time? has one more. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm just seeing your, your message. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so a quick timing question for you, Caitlin. So mm -hmm. especially maybe for people who haven't done this before or don't have a relationship with an editor or paper, how would you recommend people think about, you know, when to submit an LTE or an op-ed so that it is timely, whether they saw an article or an op-ed print already or they're just trying to bring in an issue for the first time. Could you talk a little bit mm -hmm. more about that timing aspect for people to help plan this out in their heads? Yeah, definitely. So um, I would say if you're writing an LTE, responding to something that's in the paper, you want to make sure you get it submitted within two weeks of when it ran. Um, in terms of submitting an op-ed, papers really vary widely on their turnaround time of when you submit a piece to when they can get it published or posted. Um, so you want to, uh, oh, and also um, sometimes papers get like a backlog of op-eds, you know, they'll have like a month's worth of pieces that they're trying to work through. So I think always submit it um, as early as possible. Um, I would say if you can submit it two weeks before you want it to run, that is ideal. Also, if you have a specific date you want the piece to run on for whatever reason, an event, a piece of legislation, whatever it may be, just tell the editor that and just say, is it possible to run this around this date? And here's why that's newsworthy. Um, you don't really have to like game the system. Just just tell them, um, you know, and, and they'll say yes or that'll work or no, it won't for this reason. But um, if you have some kind of event or launch or something happening, just communicate that timing with them. In my experience, editors are typically willing to work with you. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. One more. Sorry. Um, no, it's okay. If uh, you're, you're new and you don't have a media profile and you're trying to contact these various uh, TV stations or newspapers, mm -hmm. um, it, is it a good idea to try to contact the person directly with a personal email first and introduce yourself and say, I'm going to be sending you these press releases from time to time please put me in your contact file or something like that? Or is it not necessary because for most of these uh, media figures, they're going to look at anything that says press release anyway? Yeah, I mean, so personally, I think, again, there's no harm in sending an email. It's only going to have a net neutral or a positive effect to send a reporter an email and send and say, you know, introduce yourself and say, I work with this organization and I am going to be sending you some stuff. I've even um, said to reporters, like, I'd love to take you to a virtual coffee if you ever have time to, um, you know, to talk more about this issue. And typically reporters either won't respond or will respond positively. Um, I think reaching out and trying to be helpful rarely, you know, rarely gets a negative response. So I think, I think it's worth a try, definitely. Okay, great, thanks. What was the name of your company again? Full Court Press Communications. And I'll, um, I'll put my contact information in the chat um, and definitely feel free to reach out um, with any questions. We're happy to be a resource. Fantastic. Great. 
Thank you. Okay. Yes. Caitlin has put her uh, information in the chat. Um, so with that, we'll do a, a brief closing. And we want to thank you all. Um, I don't think you're actually seeing my screen. I apologize. I need to share my screen. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for participating tonight. We hope that you enjoyed it uh, as much as we enjoyed hearing your questions. It was great. A lot of great questions and really great to hear from uh, you all. And if you liked this program, we hope you'll join us for more. We are a completely volunteer nonprofit. Um, all our board members, we are also the staff <laughs> and we have no paid staff. So all of the support that you offer us um, by way of donations goes 100% into these kinds of programs. Um, and our efforts to connect the community with the kind of resources that will help you be really strong advocates, <clears throat> excuse me, for our public lands, for the region, um, for the critical issues affecting the communities in the desert, um, and being able to tell your story to elected officials, to navigate decision-making processes, um, these are these are complicated things. So we want to make sure, having having struggled through those those issues ourselves, we want to bring the expertise that we know is out there into the community and help you all um, be empowered to speak up and speak out for the desert. Um, so all of your donations 100% go to all of those efforts and to bringing more webinars like this one. You can go to our website, badesertcoalition.org backslash give, or that's a forward slash, I think, actually. Um, or just go to the main website and you will find the page to donate. You can also email us anytime for more information, info at desertcoalition.org. We're happy to connect with you, to talk with you, um, offer support. If we don't have the right answers for you, we will connect you to people who do. It's all about bridging resources and, and supporting the community. Um, and we hope you'll join us again. So thank you so much. We also have a monthly, uh, make it monthly donation campaign that we launched earlier this year. So if you, whether you can give $15 or 50, $10 or a hundred, whatever is in your range, um, becoming a monthly donor is very helpful to us. It allows us to plan throughout the year and know that we have steady support. Um, so again, thank you all. And with that, I will stop sharing. I will stop recording. If I could figure out how to do that. Ah, uh, yes, there we go.